اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> Islam is a religion of balance. And what that means is that one has to do the right thing in accordance with the circumstances and the conditions that they are in. Take the body for example. The immune system is a critical part of a healthy lifestyle, a healthy body, and it allows the individual to fight contagions, infections, and all sorts of uh, conditions that might arise within the human body. If the immune system experiences a disorder that makes it fight the very same cells and organs that it is meant to protect. That condition is called autoimmune disorder. Many diseases and ailments are attributed to autoimmune disorders and fall under this heading. They include multiple sclerosis, a debilitating condition. They include things like asthma, eczema, lupus, among many other problems. This example illustrates the fact that the immune system is designed to fight off specific threats. If it fails to do that and instead fights the human body, you end up with these terrible health complications. 
In the verse that I recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a stark warning to those who abandon their faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verses in Surah Al-Ma'idah, He says, O oh, you who believe, if you abandon your faith, if you become apostates, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you with people that he loves and they love him. That's the first attribute of these individuals. They love Allah and Allah loves them. Number two, they are humble towards the believers and firm towards the disbelievers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they fight and struggle in the way of God and they do not fear anyone's blame. In other words, they don't care about what others think. They will do the right thing no matter what. Then he says, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ this is part of the mercy and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow individuals to possess these qualities. We said that the first quality was that they love Allah and Allah loves them. And that's not the subject of our discussion. The second attribute is what we would like to discuss tonight in reference to Imam al-Hasan al-Mushtaba May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Allah says, أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ Again, this balance has to be maintained. Just like the example, the illustration that I provided earlier about autoimmune disorders, a person has to identify friends and distinguish them from enemies. And to treat friends with humility, to humble oneself towards the believers. Those are the ones that we're supposed to take as friends. A believer is automatically branded as a friend. Once a person enters the scope of believers, and of course, there are many descriptions for what a believer is, but at the most fundamental and basic level, a believer is one who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and takes the Holy Prophet and his appointed vicegerents as his ultimate authority. If a person enters this realm, this fold, this circle, they become believers. As soon as they become believers, they automatically acquire inalienable rights. One of those rights is that they must be treated with kindness, respect, and humility. Adhillah. The word adhillah stems from the root term dhilla, which means humiliation, but in a positive sense. Meaning that you have to humble yourself to the maximum possible extent towards the believers. Now, in order to maintain balance, the formula has to be completed. And the formula as we stated, is that you humble yourself before the believers and you take a firm stance against the disbelievers. The reason I said this, is that Imam al-Hasan, May God's peace and everlasting blessings be upon him. Was subjected to the most brutal and vicious character assassination by his enemies. Both the Umayyad dynasty as well as the Abbasids tried to tarnish the reputation of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. And so they manufactured en masse fabricated reports about the Imam's character. And they shined a very negative light 
on the personality of Imam al Hassan. For instance, they created this false persona for the Imam that portrayed him as a overindulgent and hedonistic character. Someone who was lustful, God forbid, someone who's a pleasure seeker, someone who sought wealth and fame, and wasn't too concerned about the affairs of the nation. And as I said, they manufactured these reports en masse, on a large scale. Imagine the propaganda machine of the Umayyads was so powerful that the son of Mukhtar al Thaqafi comes to Imam al Baqir and he says to him, Yabna Rasulullah, tell me, was my father a good man or an evil man? Imagine his own son can't make that distinction. The propaganda, the false reports, the fake news was so savage, so contradictory that his own son couldn't draw an accurate picture of his father. He couldn't come to a satisfactory conclusion. So he had to ask the Imam. Obviously, the other reason is that he considers the Imam to be the ultimate arbiter. He knows that the Imam's verdict is the final word, whatever the Imam says, which tells you how submissive to the Imam's authority this man was. Of course, you might have heard that the Imam responded to him by saying that, may Allah bestow his mercy upon your father. And it's this hadith which puts an end to all the discrepancies, all the disputes on the character and ultimate abode of Muhtar al-Thaqafi. In other words, there might have been issues or blemishes in his past, but this hadith sets the record straight. But this is how vicious the propaganda was. Imam al-Hasan is portrayed as a hedonistic, pleasure-seeking, overindulgent person who was interested only in money, status, and carnal desires, God forbid. Equally vicious was the portrayal of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam as a subservient and meek individual. And it's this aspect or this false portrayal of the Imam which was perhaps more persistent. In other words, some of his own Shia perceived Imam al Hassan to be like this. He's meek, he's submissive, he is someone who could be easily cowed and pushed aside. He's a pushover, as they say in this culture. To the extent that Al-Bukhari and others, they have reported this hadith, which is attributed to Rasulullah, and the Holy Prophet is reported to have said the following, in ibn hadha sayyidun, my son Al-Hasan is a master. So far so good. He's a master, meaning that he should be followed, he should be obeyed, he should be given his due position and status. But listen to what the Prophet is quoted to have said afterwards. In al Hasana ibn Hada Sayyidun Wala Allah Yuslihu Bihi Baina Fariqaini min al Muslimin. And perhaps there's going to be a day when Allah uses him in order to reconcile between two warring factions within the Muslim nation. In other words, Imam al-Hasan should be obeyed. 
Al Hassan should be respected, but not because he is ascribed to me, not because of his divinely given status, but because he's going to submit to the rule of Muawiyah. You see what a travesty of justice this is? Listen to Imam al Hassan so long as he reconciles between the believers. And of course, this is a reference to the treaty or the truce that was signed between Imam al Hassan and Muawiyah later on. In other words, if he gives in to Muawiyah and moves aside so that Muawiyah and the Umayyad dynasty could take over the leadership of the Muslim Ummah, then he is someone worthy of respect and honor. Now, we know this hadith is a fabrication, quite simply and easily, because it was Rasulullah himself who said in authentic reports that are scattered across the Sunni hadith corpus, when the Prophet addresses Ammar ibn Yasir and says to him, Ya Ammar, taqtulu kal fi'atun baghiya. O Ammar, the rebellious faction, the tyrannical army is the one that's going to kill you. If a faction is called tyrannical, baghi in Arabic refers to the worst form of tyranny. It's a synonym of dhulm. And refer to the Qur'an to know what dhulm means, what baghi means. If Muawiyah and his group are labeled as bughat and tyrannical and rebellious, how could the Prophet then say, my son Hassan is a good man so long as he reconciles between Muawiyah and his own camp? It makes absolutely no sense. So this portrayal, this image of Imam al-Hasan as this subservient, meek pushover was one of the greatest crimes committed against Imam al-Hasan Again, creating an image that if not transfixed in the minds of every Muslim including the Shia, at the very least it left traces in our collective minds. Imam al Hassan, someone who is not interested in fighting, not interested in being confrontational. He's a peaceful man, he's a pacifist. This is one of the greatest crimes committed against Imam al Hassan. How could Imam al Hassan be like this when he himself was approached by a man who tragically was one of his Shia, one of his followers? towards the end of his blessed life. The report says that this man came to the Imam and he said to him, لَقَدْ أَذْلَلْتَ رِقَابَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَجَعَلْتَنَا عَبِيدًا لِبَنِي أُمَيَّةِ You have humiliated the believers and you have turned us into slaves of Bani Umayyah. Imam Al-Hasan said, how? He said, when you submitted لِهَذَا الطَّاغِيَ Meaning, Muawiyah. This tyrant, this despot, you submitted to him and you've, you humiliated us. So listen to how the Imam responded to him. He said, Wallahi, ma salahtuhu illa liqillatin nasir. By God, I would never have signed this treaty with Muawiyah had I had enough supporters. Had I had fighters who were loyal to me, وَلَوْ كَانَ لِي أَنصَارٌ لَقَاتَلْتُهُ لَيْلِي وَنَهَارِي And had I had individuals who were loyal to me, who would listen to me and follow my lead, I would have continued to fight him day and night. حَتَّى يَحْكُمَ اللَّهِ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَهِ Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settles it between us. In other words, he grants victory to the righteous and defeat to the immoral and impious. Then, again, it tells you the severity of the tragedy. 
Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, the report says, فَخَرَجَ مِنْ جَوْفِهِ دَمٌ وَأَلْقَى قِطْعًا مِنْ كَبِدِهِ Just as he was speaking to this man, blood started gushing out of his mouth and there were chunks of his liver that the Imam spewed out of his mouth. This is when he's having this conversation with this man. And then the Imam told him, <clears throat> he said, إِنَّ هَذَا الطَّاغِيَةَ قَدْ سَمَّنِي وَقَتَلَنِي Look at what he has done to me. This is only because I lacked supporters and companions. How could Imam Al-Hasan be portrayed as meek and subservient when he was only seven or eight years old? And again, this is mentioned in numerous Sunni books and collections of hadith that the Imam as a child walks into the masjid, into the mosque of Rasulullah, فَصَعَدَ الْمِنْبَ He saw Abu Bakr sitting on the pulpit. The Imam ascended the pulpit. In other words, he stepped on the minbar itself. And he pointed to Abu Bakr and said to him, انزل من على منبر أبي Get off of the pulpit of my father. In other words, you have no authority. Who are you to be sitting on this pulpit? This pulpit belongs to my father. Meaning the caliphate belongs to my father. He is the legitimate heir to Rasulullah. He is the appointed successor to the Holy Prophet. Appointed by God Himself. And so these same Sunni reports, which are authentic by the way, and they've been reported by the likes of uh, Al-Asqalani, Al-Haytami, Al-Siyuti, among others, that Abu Bakr being humiliated by this child, had it been Amir al-Mu'mineen, he would have had him killed. Had it been any one of the companions of the Imam, he would have had them killed. This is at a time when he had an army which launched a crusade across the Muslim nation in order to quell any form of dissent. But since it's a child, and since it is Imam al-Hasan, about whom Rasulullah had said, if there is anything beautiful in this world, it is Imam Hassan. He is the flower that this dunya has given me. Al Hassan wal Hussein, Imaman qama aw qa'ada. Abu Bakr couldn't do anything to Imam Al Hassan. And so then he says to the Imam, he says to him, the Imam initially told him, Inzil min ala minbari abi. وَصْعَدْ عَلَى مِنْبَرِ أَبِيك Go and sit on your father's pulpit. This is my father's. So Abu Bakr said to him, لَيْسَ لِأَبِي مِنْبَرْ وَإِنَّهُ مِنْبَرُ أَبِيك You're right. This is your father's pulpit. This is his position. My father didn't have any status or position. Abu Quhaf who was alive and who was opposed to his son according to uh, multiple reports. So, how could a person like that, who as a child challenges the self-appointed caliph in this public fashion and says these words to him, end up being the meek and submissive individual that they try to portray him as? It makes absolutely no sense. So, this is Imam al-Hasan. When it comes to the tyrants, he showed no weakness whatsoever. When it comes to the leaders of hypocrisy, Imam al Hassan exhibited absolutely no meekness. When it comes to the worst of the worst, like Muawiyah, Imam al Hassan's stance was crystal clear. A'izzatin al kafirin. But the other side of the equation is what I want to talk about tonight a little bit because we want to draw a lesson from the life and example of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Adillatin al mu'mineen. Before I get into that, one critical point that I want you to think about is this. If this equation of being humble towards the believers and firm towards the disbelievers, if it's disturbed in any way, if any side of the equation is disturbed, the other side, more often than not, is also disturbed. Meaning, 
that if an individual exhibits humility towards the disbelievers, they often exhibit firmness and aggression towards believers. It goes hand in hand. And the other way around. If someone exhibits any aggression towards believers, you'll often find them exhibiting humility towards the disbelievers. Oftentimes we see people who advocate the idea of unconditional love towards everyone. And there are plenty of people like that. Unconditional. The disbelievers, followers of other religious denominations, individuals with whom we have deep ideological differences, you'll find them showing humility towards them. And although you'd expect them to be consistent in their approach, if you're all about love for all, hatred for none, if you're all about embracing the other, especially the disbelievers, you'd expect these people to be consistent and also be humble towards the believers, but no. When the balance is tipped in favor of one side, it's tipped against the other side. And so you'll find these individuals, again, there are many examples, I don't want to give them any publicity, I don't want to cite actual names of individuals or groups, but again, this is, uh, if you like, a, a law that I'd like you to keep in your mind when analyzing individuals. You'll find them being overly accommodating towards the disbelievers, but as soon as it gets to the believer's side, you'll see them being really aggressive. Really aggressive. So, Imam al-Hasan salam wasn't like that. He applied this Quranic principle in the most beautiful way. Again, as I said, when it comes to the disbelievers, the Imam's stance was very firm. As for the believers, which I'll get to later on, that's a whole other story. But there was a group of people, almost in the middle, although they were closer to the disbelieving side, that Imam al-Hasan treated with such decorum, with such manners, that was baffling to everyone. You've all heard that Imam Hussein السلام, treated Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi with such incredible and breathtaking kindness that turned Al-Hur from an enemy to an intimate friend, to someone who sacrificed himself for Imam Hussein السلام. How did the Imam do this? The Imam did it by showing him generosity, showing him kindness, when he came along with a thousand men who were all parched and thirsty, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam ordered his companions and his family members to give them the most precious thing in the desert, which is water. The Imam said, These men are thirsty, knowing what their mission was, knowing what their mandate was, being fully aware of the fact that they would be fighting with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, killing his companions and his family members, and even a six month old infant. Imam al Hussein said, Give them water. Not only that, he then said, Feed their horses. Knowing that it, was, it would be these horses who will trample over his blessed body. Imam al Hussein did this, and in return, he was able to save that one soul. And so, if you are told that Imam al Hassan salam spent 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of his life in order to save one soul, you shouldn't be surprised because that's their mission in this life. It's to try and save as many people as possible. And if it's only one person 
and Imam al-Hasan had to pay the highest price to save that individual, the Imam would deem that to be worthy and appropriate. It's an appropriate price. Again, people who were not in the friends camp. You've heard the example of this man from Sham who came to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam and he addressed the Imam in the most vulgar way. It's a famous story. There is another incident which is similar to that but different in a few key places. And that tells you that this incident occurred on multiple occasions. It wasn't just once. Again, as I said, the propaganda machine of the Umayyad rule was incredibly powerful. And so it wasn't just one or two or ten or a thousand people who tried to insult Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. But look at how the Imam responds. The man says that he's the one who reports the story. He says that I came to Medina. Suddenly I saw an individual being surrounded by a lot of people. In other words, it was rather unusual. Everyone flocking to this person that I didn't recognize. He says, فَسَأَلْتُ عَنْهُ I asked, who is this person? فَقَالُوا إِنَّهُ الْحَسَنْ SubhanAllah. Traditions and reports state, by the way, that whenever Imam al-Hasan came out of his door, there would be such a crowd that they would cause congestion in the alleyways. They would all just come and gaze at the majestic beauty of Imam al-Hasan. Just the light that he exuded from his blessed face. Let alone those who came to Imam al-Hasan to ask him for favors, to ask him for help, and so on. So he says that I noticed Imam al-Hasan was surrounded by all of these people. فَحَسَدْتُ عَلِيًّا عَلَى بْنِهِ هَذَا I suddenly became envious of Ali ibn Abi Talib for having a son like this. He says it openly. I became jealous. So I went up to him. And I said to him, Anta ibn Abi Talib? Are you the son of Abu Talib? The Imam said, no. I am the son of the son of Abu Talib. That's my father you're talking about. فَنِلْتُ مِنْ هُوَ مِنْ أَبِي He says, I began cursing him, hurling the most vulgar profanities towards him and his father. فَنِلْتُ مِنْ هُوَ مِنْ أَبِي وَشَتَمْتُهُ As I was cursing him, now imagine, you have a father like Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's one thing to be insulted yourself, but to hear your father being insulted, the Imam didn't even interrupt him. He didn't say a word, this man says. When I was done, imagine, he continued to insult the Imam until he ran out of insults. He says, when I was done, he smiled and looked at me. I mean, the self-control is just mind-boggling how the Imam is able to contain his anger is out of this world. Ibtasam, he smiled and he looked at me and he said to me, Araka gharibin, you seem to be a stranger. You're from out of town. I've never seen you here before. Then he said to him what he said to that other man. He said, if you have any needs, tell me and we will. Fulfill them. If you're looking for a place to rest, we have a place where you can rest. If you require any financial assistance, أغنينك. وَإِن كُنْتَ مُحْتَاجًا أغنينك. Think about this. أغنينك means we will give you so much until you become self-sufficient. You'll become rich. The Imam said all of this. As if he had met an old friend. Imagine you see someone that you absolutely love and admire and you haven't seen him in a long time. This is how you address him. Not someone who just went on a tirade of cursing you and your father. 
The man says, I subtly felt the sense of shame immediately. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْأَرْضِ مَنْ أُحِبُّهُ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ Allah I suddenly felt this incredible affinity towards him, this love towards Imam al Hassan. وَمَا ذَكَرْتُ مَقَالَتَهُ وَمَقَالَتِي فِيمَا بَعْدِ And later on, every time I remembered this incident, I felt such shame and humiliation. How could I have done this? This is how they treat enemies who were ignorant. Again, not the kuffar, not the heads of hypocrisy and disbelief. People who are in the enemy camp, but they're only there because they happen to be ignorant. And the Imam is trying to save them. He's not trying to settle scores. The whole point is that, is that if this person has any potential or capacity to be saved, Imam al Hassan السلام, would go out of his way to do so. This is one example. The other example is Marwan ibn al Hakam himself. Again, you might have heard this before. When Imam al Hassan السلام, passed from this world, his brothers took him out and they held a funeral for him. فَجَاءَ مَرْوَانَ حَتَّى أَصْبَحَتْ تَحْتَ سَرِيرَ الْحَسَنِ Marwan, who was a sworn enemy of Imam al-Hasan, who was an individual who spearheaded the profanities against Amir al muminin He himself would curse the Imam day in and day out. This man came and he helped carry the casket of Imam al Hassan. So Imam al Hussein looked at him. He said to him, Anta tasna'u hakada wa qad kunta bil ams tujarri'uhu al ghayd. You're carrying his casket now, and up until yesterday, you would insult him and hurt him and cause him grief. Faqala na'am kuntu asna'u dhalik. بِمَنْ يُعَادِلُ حِلْمُهُ الْجِبَالِ Yes, I used to do that to a man whose forbearance and patience and mercy and kindness outweighed the mountains. This is the testimony of an enemy of Imam al-Hasan. يُعَادِلُ حِلْمُهُ الْجِبَالِ So he's not exaggerating. This is something that he's witnessed himself. Parenthetically, I'll mention this. Imam al-Hasan had a name that was given to him by God himself. You've heard the story of his birth when Rasulullah came to see his grandson and he asked Amir al-Mu'mineen, did you name him? The Imam said that I would never have preceded you. I waited for you to come so that you would name him. So the Holy Prophet said that I would never proceed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will wait for God to give me instructions as to what name we should award this first grandson of mine. And that's when Jibra'il came and said, you should name him Shabir, Arabized into Hassan. So that was the name of Imam al-Hassan. The Imam had other names that were awarded to him by his father, his mother, titles, nicknames, and whatnot. Kareem, which translates to generous, is not one of the names awarded by the Holy Prophet or the family of Imam al Hassan. Even though Imam al Hassan is known worldwide to everyone who knows Imam al Hassan, he knows him as Kareem, the generous one. Why? Because even though this name wasn't awarded to the Imam by Rasulullah or his parents, this name was, the, the attribute of generosity was witnessed and experienced by so many that it became trendy. You know how on social media, sometimes you have trending topics, trending headlines. The generous was a trending headline 
that described Imam al Hassan alayhi salam because so many people experienced it, so many people witnessed it. They saw it with their own two eyes. So, another incident involving Marwan ibn al Hakam, they say, and I'll summarize this they say that Imam al Hassan had a mule. Marwan was a very, very rich man. You could describe him as being filthy rich. In today's um, monetary value, he would have been worth tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. So he was very rich. And yet, despite his wealth, he had his eye on the mule of Imam al Hassan, which tells you that this mule was valuable, it was special. You know how today you've got different car brands and even within the same brand you have cars that are better and more expensive and more luxurious than others, right? You have the C-Class in the Mercedes-Benz group and then you have the Maybach. This mule was considered a very beautiful, very uh, useful, very... Uh, it, was, it was a very... Uh, expensive kind of animal to have. So Marwan had his eye on it. So what he does is he orchestrates this scenario where one of his friends uh, is tasked with taking the mule from Imam al Hassan. And without getting into the details, Marwan said to him that if you do me this one favor, I will do 30 favors for you. 30. So this man goes and he asks Imam al Hassan in a particular way to give him the mule. The Imam immediately got off the mule. He gave it to that man. Then he said to him, If Marwan himself had asked me, I would have given it to him too. In other words, I know he wanted it. And if he'd asked me, even though Marwan is Marwan, I would have given him the mule. He treats his enemies like this. So that maybe, maybe they turn around and they change their ways and they embrace the path of righteousness as opposed to the vile nature that they possessed. This is Imam al Hassan. Now, I want to mention uh, something that I think, as believers and as followers of Imam al Hassan, as lovers at the very least, of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, we can learn from. There's a beautiful narration by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In which the Holy Prophet says, Ala unabbi'ukum bi khayr al khala'iq fi dunya wal akhirah. Do you wish for me to tell you about the most noble virtues in this world as well as the next? Imagine. What is the most noble virtue? Rasulullah explains. He says, أَن تَصِلَ مَنْ قَطَعَكَ وَتُعْطِي مَنْ حَرَمَكَ وَتَعْفُ عَمَّنْ وَلَمَكَ If we are followers of Imam al Hassan, or if we aim to follow in his footsteps, this is one thing we could learn from him. Too often, we find people within the fraternity of believers, within the community of those who associate themselves with Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, where tiny disagreements devolve into major schisms and fights erupt and hatred festers in the heart of believers against one another. And one of the excuses that we commonly hear is that he treats me like this, I'm going to reciprocate. He said this about me, I will say that about him. He mistreated me and I'll mistreat him. Whereas Rasulullah teaches us in this hadith, and Imam al Hassan illustrates this in his conduct. And tasilaman qata'ak. 
if someone is kind to you. It's nothing to brag about when you reciprocate the kindness. What's so special about that? If someone invites you, he's already done you a favor. He's taken the prerogative for you to go and invite him. Is simply returning the favor. The Holy Prophet says, when someone severs relations with you, that is when you're supposed to establish relations with them. When someone refuses to say salam to you, that's when you go out of your way to say salam to them. When a family member decides to cut you off, that is when you reestablish and rekindle the relationship with that person. And when someone deprives you, that is when you give them and offer them from your money, your possessions, the things that you have. Again, this is something that Imam al-Hasan salam led by example in the most noble, most pristine, most exquisite and most beautiful of matters. Now imagine, if Imam al-Hasan treated his enemies like that, how would he treat his friends? In one report, it says that a person came to Imam al-Hasan and he recited poetry praising the Imam. Not praising him as an individual, but praising his position, praising the status of Imam, praising the fact that he came from the family of Rasulullah. So he came to the Imam, he said to him, I have a few verses of poetry that I'd like to read, and it's about you. The Imam said, stop. He asked the servant, he said, how much money do we have left? He said, we have three pouches, three bags of money, of gold or silver. The Imam said, bring them all. He took them, he gave it to the man. The man said, I haven't even read my poetry. The Imam said, no, 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 no. Once you read your poetry, I won't have enough money to offer you. By the mere virtue of you expressing your desire to come to us and to speak those verses, to recite those verses of poetry about the grandson of Rasulullah, I'm giving you all I have. Once you start reciting, I won't be able to compensate you sufficiently. This is Imam al -Hassan. One report again, which I found in Sunni sources, says that one day Imam al-Hasan uh, saw this slave. And the slave had a loaf of bread. So the Imam began observing him. By the way, this report, there's a similar one that's attributed to Imam al-Hussein But again, there are some minor differences which tell you that this happened on more than one occasion. This is the household of generosity. This is the household that exhibited the most noble virtues of the divine. And so it is absolutely not uh, surprising that they would do this over and over and over again. So the Imam saw this slave he took that loaf of bread and he, there was a dog sitting in front of him. He took the loaf of bread, he broke it in half, he gave one half to the dog and he ate the other half. Imam al-Hasan went to him. He said to him, what is this I just saw you do? Why would you give half of your food? And these were slaves, right? They didn't have, you know, food, uh, whatever they desired. All he had was this loaf. He said, why did you do this? He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, as I was about to start eating, I saw my eyes met the eyes of the dog. And I thought to myself, I'm a creation of God, and so is this dog. I'm hungry, so is this dog. So I felt ashamed of eating and not offering half of my portion, half of my food to this, dog, to this dog. The Imam said to him, whose slave are you? He said, I am the slave of Aban ibn Uthman, a man. 
Imam said to him, wait right here. Don't go anywhere. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I work here. I'm not going to go anywhere. So the Imam went and came back. He said to him, لَقَدْ اشْتَرَيْتُكَ بِنْ أَبَانِ ibn Uthman. I have just purchased you. In other words, I have freed you by buying you from your master. Also, I bought this farm that you're looking after and I'm gifting it to you. Now, on a night like this, at a time when we're commemorating the martyrdom of Imam al-Hasan and speaking about his virtues and his merits, and talking about how the Imam used to do this, just like all the other Imams, they would purchase these slaves and grant them their freedom, more often than not against their will. <laughs> Meaning, he granted them their freedom even though they didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay with the Imams. I say, Ya Aba Muhammad, Ya Hassan ibn Ali, Ayyuh al-Mushtaba, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. How about you also purchase us? Purchase us from our slave masters, from our desires, from our temptations. Bring us closer to you. This is how Imam al-Hassan would treat his friends. And I believe that the Imam freed the slave instead of taking him and teaching him and so forth as he did with many other slaves because that man was already at a point of gnosis and understanding that he probably could uh, be freed and be allowed to flourish on his own. The fact that he said, I was ashamed of a dog because he's a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man says that I went to Hajj. While I was in the vicinity of the Kaaba, I saw two young women, two girls. They were sitting next to each other and they were, they were speaking to one another. And so one was saying to the other, لا وحق لا وحق المنتجب بالوصية وَالْحَاكِمِ بِالسَّوِيَّةِ بَعْلِ الزَّهْرَاءِ الْمَرْضِيَّةِ لَمْ أَفْعَلْ كَذَا وَكَذَا She swore in the name of Amir al-Mu'mineen, but did so while listing the virtues of the Imam alayhi salam. She said, I didn't do such and such, but she praised Amir al-Mu'mineen and swore in his name. So the man says that I went up to these two girls and I said to them, أَوَ تَعْرِفَانِ عَلِيًّا Again, this is at a time of incredible oppression, persecution, suppression. People couldn't speak of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib and yet these two young women were saying these things. Do you know who Ali ibn Abi Talib is? That woman looked at this man and said to him, وَكَيْفَ لَا أَعْرِفُ عَلِيًّا وَقَدْ قُتِلَ أَبِي وَعَمِّي وَأَوْلَادْ أَعْمَامِي فِي صفين وَالْجَمَلْ how could I not know him? We come up from, from a, we come from a family of devotees to Ali ibn Abi Talib. My father and my uncle and my cousins were killed in battle defending the Imam and his mission. So the man says that I felt so proud of them that I put my hand in my pocket. I had a gold coin. I took it out and I said, here's a gift from me to you. The woman threw the money back at me. And she said to me, أَوَتُحَقِّرُ مُحِبَّ عَلِيًّ Do you take the lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib as beggars? We don't need your money. وَإِنَّا فِي عِيَالَةِ خَيْرِ, سل... خير خَلَفٍ لِخَيْرِ سَلَفٍ إِنَّا فِي عِيَالَةِ الْحَسَنِ ابن علي المشتبى. We are, اللهم صلى الله عليه وسلم. We are under the guardianship of the most noble successor to the most noble predecessor. We are under the care and protection and guardianship of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. We don't need your money, you can keep that. That's what Imam al-Hasan did. Imam al-Hasan would make his followers and his 
devotees and his partisans self-sufficient. Not financially per se, but self-sufficient in terms of pride. Being followers of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam were one of his people, were one of his followers. Subhanallah. This is how Imam al-Hasan acted. And yet, he was always confronted with enmity, with hatred. You've heard that Imam al-Hasan, perhaps you've heard this, that Imam al-Hasan gave everything that he possessed, his entire net worth, he gave it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala three times. خَرَجَ مِنْ مَالِهِ Include, and there were two occasions in which Imam al-Hasan halved his net worth. Everything that he had, he halved it and gave it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My question is, who did the Imam give all of that to? The city of Medina was not comprised of the Shia of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. The vast overwhelming majority of the inhabitants of the city were opposed to the Ahlul Bayt. They were opposed to Amir al mumini Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, who was the son-in-law of Imam al-Hasan, remember. Imam al-Hasan's daughter, Fatima bint al-Hasan, was married to Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam. Imam al-Sajjad, he, after the tragedy of Karbala, he said that only 20 households in Medina are Shia. 20 out of an entire city. So when Imam al-Hasan was giving charity, which can't really be called charity, when you're giving everything that you have. But when he was providing assistance to people, when he was giving people the things that they asked, he wasn't giving it to his friends. He was giving it either to random strangers or people who opposed him, people who hated him. But subhanAllah, the hadith says that uh, a, a generous person will attract the love of those who hate him. Generosity has this power. And if we are going to display a beautiful image of Islam in non-Muslim countries, it has to be done first and foremost through our conduct and akhlaq, and secondly through our generosity. The centers that provide food to non-Muslims Free food. In Western culture, there's no such thing as free food. There's no such thing as free anything. Right? So when you find a center or you find a group or you find a youth committee that provides food during the months of Muharram and Safar to non-Muslims, this is a very rapid way of attracting the love and respect of people who would otherwise never even think about Islam or getting close to a Muslim, or even talking to a Muslim. So the hadith says that generosity is something that attracts the love of your enemies. And miserliness and stinginess makes your own children despise you. Your own children. And I, I know of people, young men and women, who hate their father because he's stingy. Generosity of Imam al Hassan salam, is an example for us to follow. And yet, he was confronted with hatred, he was confronted with enmity, and he was treated in the worst possible way to the extent that his own companions, one of them, he came, فَطَعَنَ الْحَسَنَ بِخَنْجَرٍ مَسْمُومٍ فِي فَخِذِهِ a poison dagger was used to stab the Imam in his thigh. It got to a point where Imam al Hassan salam had no one, with the exception, of course, of his brothers, but no one stayed with him. His own cousin Ubaidullah ibn al Abbas left the Imam, committed high treason, 
and he took along thousands of the fighters who were in the army of Imam al-Hassan that he was commanding, he went and took all of them and switched sides to Muawiyah. Ubaidullah ibn Abbas had lost two of his children at the hand of Muawiyah, at the treacherous and venomous schemes of Muawiyah. And yet he abandoned Imam al-Hassan and went to the other side. It got to a point where Imam al-Hassan would be sitting on the front porch of his house. Rahmatullah alayhi. May Allah bless his soul. Shaykh Baqar alam al Huda used to say that when I read this report, I burst into tears. And I cried and cried and cried for hours. He said, The reason is why would Imam al Hassan have to sit on his front porch? The only explanation was that outside of the home, the Imam had nothing but enemies. And inside his house, the closest person to him, his own wife, was also an enemy. Ju'ada bint al-Ash'ath alayha wa ala abiha wa ala akhiha la'natullah. This woman who ended up poisoning Imam al-Hasan on a hot day when the Imam was fasting, the Abi or Ummi. في يوم شديد الحر وكان صائما. The Imam came home to break his fast. He asked her for something, food, or and she came and offered him لبنا مسموما. She gave him milk that was poisoned with a substance that was sent by Muawiyah and was sent to Muawiyah by the Roman cohorts that he had asked for something that would kill the Imam without any hesitation, instantaneously. And so as soon as the Imam drank the poisonous milk, the Imam began coughing up blood. Imam al Hussein was summoned. Imam al Hassan himself said, I want my brother to come. Imam al Hussein came as soon as he saw his brother he burst into tears. Imam al-Hussein cried. Then he noticed Imam al-Hassan was also crying. He said to him, Mimma buka'uka, Sayyidi, Ya Aba Muhammad. So Imam al-Hassan said that I am worried for two things. I am sad. I am grieving for two things. The first is Hawl al it is the fact that I don't know which of my actions Allah will accept, which of them He won't accept, subhanAllah. People like me do something tiny and then have so many expectations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, I gave this charity. Oh, I went to ziyah. Oh, I went to hajj or what have you. And this is Imam al-Hasan who says that I'm afraid and I'm grieving. I don't know what's about to come. That's the first reason. The second reason is because I'm about to depart and I will be separated from Hussein. I'll be separated from Abbas. I'll be separated from my sister Zainab. My son Al-Qasim is about to go. And so the Imam then said to Aba Abdullah al Hussein, he said to him, Brother, be a father to my children. Allahu Akbar. Treat them with kindness and love. They will grow up as orphans. I want you to look after them. And so Imam al Hussein cried. And it's at that moment that Imam al Hassan said to him, Don't cry, my brother. Don't cry because as tragic as the martyrdom of Imam al-Hasan was, the Holy Prophet said, it was an incredible tragedy. And yet Imam al-Hasan says to his brother, he says, but there is no day like your day, Ya Aba Abdullah, when 30,000 people will 
surround you and shed your blood with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Imam al Hassan departed from this world. He had left instructions for his brother. Imam al Hussein came. He bathed him. He shrouded him. He then took him. Bani Hashim surrounded Imam al Hassan. They went and held a funeral for their brother. And that's when the wicked woman came. When she realized that Imam al Hassan had left instructions to be buried next to his grandfather Rasulullah, she came out and said, لا يدفن في بيتي من لا أحب. I will never let him be buried in my home, meaning the home of Rasulullah. How did it become your home? I don't know. I will never let him be buried there. And so she then ordered the body of Aba, Aba Muhammad al Hassan to be showered with arrows. They shot the arrows in the direction of the casket, the funeral. Imam al Hassan had told his brother that I don't want any blood to be shed over my burial. And if this happens, which he knew would happen, I want for you to go and bury me in the Baqi'ah Cemetery. Imam al Hussein took his brother. He went to the Baqi'ah Cemetery. He dug the grave with his own hands. He lowered his brother Imam al Hassan into the grave. Then they suddenly noticed the shoulders of Imam al Hussein shaking as he was crying over his brother. The Imam was heard saying, فَلَيْسَ حَرِيبٌ مَنْ فَلَيْسَ حَرِيبٌ مَنْ أُصِيبَ بِمَالِهِ وَلَكِنَّ مَنْ وَارَى أَخَاهُ حَرِيبٌ The plundered one isn't the one who has had his wealth taken, his money stolen. The one who is plundered is the one who has just buried his entire being, his heart in the ground. The one who has lost a brother like Imam al Hassan. Now I wish to address Imam al Hassan and say, Your tragedy is truly heart-rending, it is painful. But Ya Aba Muhammad, You were bathed, you were shrouded, you had your family come to your funeral. Your brother buried you with honor and grace. I wish you were there on the day of Ashura and the 13th of Muharram to witness your brother Abba Abdullah. An Arab poet says, don't say that Hussein wasn't bathed, he was indeed bathed, but in a different way. Ajarakallah, Allah. Instead of being bathed with water, he was bathed with the blood gushing out of his jugular vein. Don't tell me that Hussein wasn't shrouded. Don't tell me that he wasn't turned around during the bathing, during the ghusl. He was indeed turned around by the hooves of the horse. Don't tell me that he wasn't shrouded. He was shrouded by 
are all the blades and the swords and the spears. He adds one more verse. He says, don't tell me that Hussein didn't have a funeral. Then how would you explain his head being raised on a spike and paraded through the desert from town to town and city to city?